All right, good morning, and you're welcome to a brand new week. It's COVID-19 360, and we really are not in normal times, especially because I can tell you for a fact that since Monday, the 8th of June up until today, uh, which is the 15th of June, Ghana has recorded 2,044 cases. And I'll give you a breakdown. As of Monday, 8th of June, the numbers were 9,910. By Wednesday, the 10th of June, it had moved to 10,201. By Thursday, it was 10,358. Friday, it moved to 10,856. Saturday morning, it was 11,118. And uh, by Saturday afternoon, it was 11,400. Uh, well, Sunday afternoon, it was 11,422. And as at the time the president addressed the nation uh, during his 11th address, which was around 8 p.m., we had recorded 11,954. And so if you calculate, that's 2,044 new cases in the last one week. And that indeed is cause for worry. And more reason why we will not back down on the education that we've been giving you on COVID-19 360, because we believe that you deserve to know what's happening so you can protect yourself even after the president has insisted that uh, by the executive instruments, the authorities will ensure that anybody who flouts the directive of wearing a nose mask will be made to face the full rigors of the law. So today we have more information for you. Again, you're welcome to COVID-19 360. My name is Bella Munde. And my name is Anita Ikia Akufu. Right here on the African continent, South Africa is the first country to take that huge step in testing over 1 million people. And this morning with over 70,000 cases and a lot, uh, that is over 1,000 police officers in South Africa being affected by the virus right here on COVID-19 360. I'll be giving you all the updates and how also on the global front we are inching closer to the 8 million mark. And so you can get in touch with us via social media media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And also our WhatsApp number is active where you can get to send us your messages. And while schools are also reopening right here in uh, Ghana for the final year students, have you been in school yet? What is happening on the various campuses? You can let us know right here on COVID-19-360, Bella. Absolutely. Now, like I said, uh, the case count currently is 11,954. And so that means that Ghana's case count is 36 shy of 12,000 with deaths now standing at 54. And of course, uh, that means that our current case count, uh, we've moved to the fourth position on the continent just after South Africa, Egypt and Nigeria. And this is a position we never occupied from the onset uh, of the virus being recorded on the continent so national positivity rate which has for long stayed around the three percent uh mark and lower markets over the past two months has within a few days moved just 0 0.3 shy of a five percent rate so the rhetoric uh that the national case count is increasing because the country is doing more tests now it, it begs the question is the is you know is the infection spreading as a result of the test are we recording more numbers as a result of the test or is this spreading at the same time as the tests are going on? So yesterday, the president did say that, uh, you know, we're ahead of it. We're recording uh, more cases. And that's because we are testing and testing and testing. But now we're worried that it actually might be spreading even more. And that's scary. It is. And right from the beginning of COVID-19, 360, when our figures started going, um, you know, into the thousands, we kept mentioning that community spread or community infections was quite high and that time we we're around the, the 1200 yeah but we saw that a lot of people were still contracting the virus and mm -hmm. were recording uh, more cases as well and so i personally think that the spread on the community level is rather high yeah and it's not necessarily because we're doing a lot of tests exactly. but the spread is actually high it is and that's because people are not adhering to the um you know protocols i mean we're being asked to wear masks constantly we're being told to wash your hands with soap and the running water have a sanitizer and I'll ask you, when was the last time you bought a hand sanitizer? After the one you were using got finished. I think that people have relaxed. And so um, yeah, we'll have Della visit the market to, of course, give us some information um, on how people are adhering to it. But let's talk about stigma quickly. And this weekend, I was highly disappointed. Extremely. Um, in government officials, especially in the health minister as well, because I was hoping that if really he had contracted the virus, he would come out and say that, yes, the rumors are true. I have the virus, but I'm in the hospital and I'm being taken care of. So I'm going to use myself as an example for people to know that it is real. Because there are still Ghanaians who, who are don't saying believe that, that it's oh, here. So they think that it's only from travelers and they will not get the virus. 
People don't even think it exists in the first place. And so if our health minister really did contract the virus, like the president confirmed later, why were they saying, uh, you know, that he didn't have it and he was just resting at the hospital? You remember that sometime in May, I think it was uh, 28th May, so minority chief with um, Anabo Mutaka Mubarak yeah. came out and insisted that some two government officials and 13 parliamentary staff had contracted the virus. And that was after they conducted their mass testing in parliament. Mm -hmm. And there were rumors that some people had contracted it. Parliament came out and said nobody had it. It had not been recorded and so we should ignore it. He came out and said there are some two people who had it uh, and they are government officials mm -hmm. plus staff. And then weeks down the line, here we are with the president confirming that our health minister has also contracted. We wish him the best, by it's, the way. I mean, it's I such really a bad example, that, if yeah. you ask me. Because, you know, uh, during one of the roundtable discussions we had right here at TV3, one of the panelists, and I made mention of that statement mm -hmm. right here on COVID-19 360, that she was trying to compare our situation down here to, you know, other countries where even when you recover and you're coming home, people are cheering yeah, you on and they're yeah. excited about it. And it's very important to come out and then let people know that, mm -hmm. oh, this is... What is happening? This is yeah. what I've been through. And even if you get it, you can still recover. Absolutely. And for the health minister, he's been one of the people who, uh, through all the press briefings, he's been championing this cause of stigmatization. Exactly. Of, uh, how do you call it? People adhering to all the social distancing protocols and wearing your mask and all of that. And so this was a time for him to be that hero, for exactly. him to be, you know, a good example. And I'm highly disappointed, but... Uh, all the same, we wish him all the best and we pray we that do. he recovers. And we hope that moving forward, um, I mean, any of us could contract. At this point, there's no respect of persons. So it's fair if you have contracted and you come out. I mean, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he ran us through his process, and literally. I mean, everybody saw what you happened know, I know him. that maybe at some point they were trying to cover up because I remember when he was rushed to the ER, they were mm -hmm. trying to cover up a bit. But regardless, even when he was coming out, there was a video of the health team applauding, you know, showing support. The French minister, uh, French president as mm -hmm. well, when his wife contracted yeah. it, he came out and said it. So why can we not say it? If we're not setting ourselves as examples, then why, how are we going to fight the issue of stigmatization? Because if you can't come out and say it, how do you expect people around you to also know more about the virus and support you? That's the problem. Anyway, there's so much to talk about, but before that, it's time for the COVID-19 news update. So take a look. Welcome to the news update on COVID-19 360. The president, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado, has made the wearing of face marks mandatory in the wake of sharp rise in the number of COVID-19 cases in Ghana. He pointed out that the police and law enforcement agencies will enforce this directive through an executive instrument. Leaving our homes without a face mask or face covering is an offence. The police have been instructed to enforce this directive, which is the subject of an executive instrument, the president said in his address to the nation on Sunday. Meanwhile, he has wished Ghana's health ministry Minister Kweku Ajiman Menu, a speedy recovery from COVID-19. French President Emmanuel Macron has announced the number of coronavirus restrictions are being lifted. Cafes and restaurants are reopening across France and travel to other European countries will be allowed. People will also be able to visit family members in retirement homes which have been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 outbreak. Germany, Belgium, Croatia and Switzerland are fully reopening borders with EU countries on Monday. Travellers from the UK will be able to visit them without quarantine or restrictions on arrival. However, those travelling to France from the UK or Spain face a two-week isolation period on arrival. Kenya's health ministry has relaxed a controversial rule that required families to bury COVID-19 victims within 48 hours after death. The stringent measures had caused an outcry after families were forced to hold night burials to beat the deadline. Patrick Amoth, the ministry's director general, has said that there's no need for rushed burials if the dead bodies are treated well. Since the start of the pandemic, local administrators have been enforcing the rule regardless of the cause of death. One of the main doctors' union in Nigeria says its members will go ahead with a strike on Monday over poor pay and lack of personal protective equipment for health workers. The Association of Resident Doctors say they will stop providing all services including emergency care and coronavirus treatment. The union's president, Iliyu Sukumba, said the government had failed to respond to the doctor's demands, including a call for extra payments to reflect the increased risk they faced during the pandemic. 
the association represents around a third of Nigeria's doctors. Meanwhile, Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari is safe after an incident involving the security detail at his main residence in the capital, Abuja, according to his spokesperson. Details are still sketchy, but President spokesperson Gaba Shehu said the incident is under investigation, adding that some staff have been arrested by the police. Beijing has recorded 36 new locally transmitted coronavirus cases amid fears of a second wave in the Chinese capital. Another 36 cases were also recorded on Saturday. The city had previously seen no new cases in more than 50 days. The country's vice premier, Sun Shilan, called on officials to take decisive measures, warning that the risk of further spread remained high. The outbreak has been linked to the city's largest wholesale market. Local media reports say the virus was discovered on chopping boards used for imported salmon at the market, prompting major supermarkets in Beijing to pull the fish from the shelves. And that's all we have for you for news updates on COVID-19 360. And that was Della with the news updates. Now moving on, Ghana's case count again is 36 shy of 12,000 with deaths now standing at 54. With a national positivity rate almost 5%, one would expect that citizens would be more cautious and adhere to social uh, safety protocols, pardon me. So Della Michelle again was at the Nima market on Friday and she filed this report. I am at the Nima market and to see if people are really adhering to some of the protocols that were outlined by the World Health Organization when we started battling with the coronavirus pandemic. Some of these protocols were the regular washing of hands with soap and the running water, the use of hand sanitizers and also the wearing of nose masks. Life has returned to normal for most people. Many traders are seen not wearing their nose marks while others didn't have it at all. Some explained their nose marks were missing or at home. For others also, the nose marks was in their pockets or aprons. Oh, our cameras captured both passengers and drivers not wearing their nose marks or wearing it the wrong way. A driver explained wearing the nose marks was uncomfortable. Nima Market was heavily congested Friday morning, making it impossible for traders and buyers to practice social distancing. The young and old had gathered in groups, deeply engaged in hearty conversations with no social distancing. When we asked, the blame game began. The regular washing of hands with soap and running water to help minimize the spread of the virus appears to be one on steep decline. I'm entering a shop now. Um, it looks like the shop doesn't have a Veronica bucket. There's no soap here. And there's even no indication of no nose marks, no entry. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has warned Africa's coronavirus pandemic rate is accelerating, describing it as a serious sign. According to data, it took 98 days for the continent to reach 100,000. But when it came to those cases doubling to 200,000, it took 18 days. Reporting for TV3 News, Della Michelle Nima, Accra. And that was Della Michelle. And indeed, just to reiterate what the president said yesterday, that now everyone is required to wear the nose mask. And he's going to ensure that authorities make this happen. If you flout it uh, by the executive instruments, you would face the full rigors of the law. Let's take a look at our case count and break it down for you in terms of Ghana. So right here in Ghana over the weekend, over 500 cases have been added to our figure. And like the president mentioned yesterday during his 11th address, 
255,334 tests have been conducted so far. And out of that, 11,964 cases have been confirmed as a positive with 7,652 being active cases and 4,258 being recoveries and 54 deaths. And now for the active cases are cases that we can say are still in the various isolation centers or some being at home and being treated as well. And so let's look at the regional breakdown and the greater Accra region over last week was, you know, hovering around the 6,000 mark. And this morning, after the last update, the Greater Accra region still standing as the epicenter in Ghana with 7,138 confirmed cases. The Ashanti region moving on steadily with 2,205 cases. Western region, 976. Central region, 652. The Volta region, 263. Upper East region with 241. Eastern region, 235. OT region, 95 cases, Western North Region 81, Northern Region 37, Upper West Region 22, Buno East Region 14, and only four regions as of this morning have recorded below 10 cases, and these regions are the Northeast Region with two, Savannah Region 1, Buno Region 1, Ahafu Region 1, and like uh, we mentioned last week, all 16 regions right here in Ghana have recorded cases, recoveries at 4,258. And for the gender distribution, the males are still leading with 58% and females at 42%. And also when it comes to uh, people who are in critical condition or severely ill, we have 13 persons who are severely ill. Six persons are critically ill with three persons on ventilators. And so this is a cumulative outlook of our case count with 247 new cases as at the last update. And over the weekend, like I mentioned, we've racked in over 500 cases just over the weekend, Bella. Hmm. Again, back to the issue of wearing face masks. Now, that along with social distancing, among key measures, experts say, can help prevent and also slow the transmission of the coronavirus. Unfortunately, there seems to be a difficult thing. Uh, that seems to be a difficult thing for people to do. So here's a news desk report on how people are flouting safety COVID-19 protocols and putting everyone at risk. In December 2019, the world woke up to a novel coronavirus outbreak first recorded in Wuhan, Hubei province, China. Within weeks, the disease spread to other countries causing havoc to lives and economies. Ghana recorded its first two cases of coronavirus on March 12, 2020. As at June 13, 2020, Ghana's confirmed COVID-19 cases stands at 11,118. In trying to contain the spread of the virus, government put in safety protocols urging people to strictly abide by them. Among other measures to prevent infections and to slow transmission of COVID-19 is washing of hands with soap and water, wearing of face masks and social distancing. The new normal, as it's been termed, has become very difficult for people to observe. For religious groups, it seems complying with these measures only applies in the church or mosque. After the close of service on Friday, people were seen together as if there was nothing at stake. Now, some Ghanaians have adopted their own ways of wearing the face marks, contrary to how experts have advised. In Parliament, when MPs are making submissions on the floor of the House, instead of maxing up, they rather max down, defeating the purpose of wearing the marks. This scene here is in total disregard for all safety protocols. It seems people have either forgotten the world is not in normal times or they are not bothered. Adhering to basic rules or guidelines to save others have now become a difficult task for many. Well, the Information Minister Kojo Aponinkroma says the government was considering legal options to enforce personal protective etiquette as part of measures to halt the spread of the coronavirus disease. He said the legal options when rolled out would ensure that people adhere strictly to personal protective protocols, which includes wearing of face masks. How soon can that be? 
Hmm, interesting. But anyways, we'll be speaking to one of the returnees from Kuwait um, on what it's been like being under mandatory quarantine. It's been three weeks since they returned. And out of um, the number that came to Ghana, about 35 of them tested positive. So we believe that they are, are going under treatment. And of course, um, for those who have left the mandatory quarantine centers, we'll be speaking to one of them to tell us what it's been like for her. We'll also be speaking to another stranded Ghanaian in the Netherlands who's very passionate about getting Ghanaians back home. But before that, let's take a look at our global and continental figures. Okay, now let's start off with Africa and the numbers keep increasing this morning. Uh, case count on the African continent is 243,712 confirmed cases with 5,537 healthcare workers being affected. 6,551 people have died due to uh, the novel coronavirus and recoveries at 111,000. 197. Well, with the 243,712 cases on the continent, South Africa is contributing a whooping 70,038 cases. And in South Africa, over 1,000 uh, South African police service you know, workers have been affected with over 14 deaths um, over there in South Africa. And with over 1 million tests and in 70,038 um, cases. That is how South Africa is looking like us at this morning. Now, when we go to Egypt, which is the second highest on the African continent, Egypt comes in with 44,598. And Egypt is one of the countries that is easing on restrictions in terms of allowing um, you know, tourists to come into the country and allowing certain curfews to be lifted as well. Now, Nigeria has Ragged him a lot of figures and now the third on the African continent over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Nigeria was the fourth and now Nigeria is third with 16,085 cases with Ghana coming in fourth with 11,964 cases. Now Algeria is also fifth with 10,919 confirmed cases and Cameroon sixth with 9,800 and 64. Now let's look at the recoveries on the continent and South Africa is leading with the recoveries and for South Africa the nine provinces, two of the provinces which is the Western Cape and then Eastern Cape are contributing the highest in terms of cases and also when it comes to recoveries as well and for the recovery South Africa has 38,531 confirmed recoveries, Egypt with 11,931, Morocco 7,779 and then Algeria with 7,606. When it comes to the recoveries, you realize that Ghana is a little below and that is also after Nigeria being the sixth and Ghana being seventh when it comes to the recoveries as compared to the confirmed cases chart. And Cameroon has 5,570 recoveries. Nigeria with 5,220 and then Ghana as of the last update with 4,000. 258. Now let's look at the deaths as well, which countries are leading. And Egypt has been leading for some time now when it comes to the deaths on the continent. And this morning, it is at 1,575, with South Africa coming in second, with 1,480. Algeria, 767. Sudan, with 459. And Nigeria, with 420 deaths. Now let's look at the healthcare workers who have been affected. And for this particular chart, it deals with frontline healthcare workers. But in other countries like South Africa, for instance, some police officers and other people who are, you know, are providing essential services have been affected as well. And we'll get you all of those details in the coming week. And South Africa is leading with 2,084. As of last week, it was a little over the two, uh, below the 2,000 mark. And so more healthcare workers are being affected in South Africa by the coronavirus and more deaths are being recorded in South Africa as well with 14 healthcare workers who have died. Nigeria second with 812 healthcare workers being affected with two deaths. Egypt on the continent has the highest number when it comes to healthcare workers who have died with 19 and then 350 cases. Cameroon with 325 and then three healthcare workers you know, who have died, and then Niger with 184, Senegal with 138. And so this is how it is looking like, um, you know, basically. And um, by the end of the week, we would have gone past the 250,000 mark 
and looking at how we are progressing steadily. But this is still COVID-19 360. We are taking a break. When we come back, we'll give you the global figures and also more right here. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360 live on TV3 and also on DSTV channel 279. Keep your messages coming in. If you have any questions as well, let us know. We'll be speaking to Dr. Betha Sewa Ai shortly. But just to give you some information, so there's an African virology webinar that is happening starting from today. And the theme is COVID-19. The African virologist experience is actually taking place on Zoom. Uh, we have uh, a professor, uh, Professor Oyewale Tomori from Nigeria. He's on the Experts Advisory Committee on COVID-19 in Nigeria. And also from here, we have Dr. Samuel Kaba Akoria. He's a director of Institutional Care Division, Ghana Health Service. And we also have some um, very experienced individuals who will be speaking to us. Um, and so if you want to tune in or you want to join in the Zoom meeting, the ID is 398-436. 5395 398-436-5395 and the password is 9XEIFS all in capital letters so 9XEIFS is the African Virology webinar and we hope that you tune in and so on that note let's go speak to Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi looking all lovely I, I don't know what to call this shade of green but I love it on you good morning doc Good morning. Thank you. And thank good morning to your audience as well. All right. It's good to have you. And I hope you had a great weekend. Now, this morning, our numbers have shot up again. In fact, literally yesterday, we recorded two different sets um, of, of numbers because in the morning, it was still around 11,000, but it was at least lower. And then all of a sudden, we shot up to 11,900 and something. And so then the conversation has been that over the, the months that we've been recording cases, we've had epicenters. Accra has always been the epicenter, but then at a point they even mentioned that, you know, Boise was becoming an epicenter. They had it under control eventually. Then uh, Sekendita Karade as well. So there are regions that have very high numbers. And people are asking, if that's the case, why are we not instituting, um, you know, a partial lockdown in some of these areas or even a nighttime curfew just to control the increase in numbers? What do you say about that? Well, I think that, um, well, thank you for the question. I'm not sure all the data that they're looking at and how hot the hotspots are, but I think at some point, like it was done, and I think the best example is New Rochelle, New York, a suburb of New York where... Doc, we were talking about whether we should go ahead with a nighttime curfew, a partial lockdown of some sort, just to control the increase in numbers. Yeah, I think there has to be, if we find, for example, that these areas have a lot of high cases, there has to be some form of restriction of movement. I think people may not actually like the word lockdown, but if it means condoning the place off for a while, and a good example I was saying was New Rochelle in New York, where they put, it wasn't a big one, like a one to 10 mile radius where nobody was supposed to move out and it was enforced. And the best example really is also the hotspots, which is the Hubei province of China, where about 60 million people were just put on lockdown that they couldn't move out because it was noticed that all over the world, they were the source of 99% of the cases. So if, for example, I'm looking at the data and it looks like over the last week, we're recording like 500 cases a day on yeah. average. That is a lot. So if we realize that maybe 80% are coming from certain areas, it's just a matter of educating, mentioning those areas like we did the very first time when we went on lockdown. It wasn't the whole country. It was some specific areas because mm. then you, you lock those places down. Because I always say this, whenever a country gets to a thousand cases a day, we are getting to that exponential phase. And already we know that it looks like the treatment centers are full. They've come mm -hmm. out to say we don't have enough ICU staff to be able to take care of all this explosion. Then you get to that phase where it's like your healthcare workers get overwhelmed. So yeah. it has to be a fine balance between, okay, we're ready to take care of patients versus, you know what? Now it looks like we're getting too many cases. And on top of that, you have over 200,000 children, I understand, who are going to go back to school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It starts we, today, actually. Yeah, we really have to um, consider and reconsider what we've been doing.
I mean, talking about the children going back to school, I know I've asked you this before, but um, is it too late to consider doing a test for them even whilst they are in school? Should it be something we should consider? It's not too late at all. I've been thinking about it all of the last 24 hours. I mean, I understand um, they're going to be giving three masks yeah, each. Yeah, reusable face mask each, yes. And hand sanitizers. But, I mean, if, if someone sitting next to me has COVID-19 and I don't know... And um, wouldn't I rather not have that person at home than the person wearing a face mask? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, true. I think, I think that we should give strong consideration to that. Okay. Now, the other concern will also be that the president yesterday during his address said that our numbers are one of the highest in Africa, and that's because we are carrying out advanced contact tracing where other countries aren't. Like you said, we've recorded over 500 cases in a day for a while now. And the concern has been that, is it really because we are testing, that's why our numbers are increasing, or are we ignoring the fact that there could be a community spread that may go out of control? And so even with us doing contact tracing and testing, maybe we're not, we might not be able to still control it? Well, I think that the expanded testing is certainly helping us identify our cases and isolate them. But the truth, Bella, is that if the cases were not there, you would look for it and you would not find it. You know, like if you don't wear, let's say, Kaba clothes, for example, it doesn't matter how much you comb through your house, you're not going to find them, right? Because yeah. that's not in your wardrobe, right? But if they're there, you're going to find them. So, yes, we're finding a lot more because we're testing, but we're finding them because they exist. Mm. So it shows us that there is that community spread. Let's go back to the issue about the students being given three nose masks each. And uh, if we know that they're reusable, I'm sure that they can use it for a number of times, wash it, and then after that, it cannot be reused again. Just to give us some education on how long we can use one nose mask for, how many times we can wash it. And is that even enough to last them the whole six weeks plus the extra four weeks where they'll be writing exams? Well, I think so. I mean, I think ideally you should wash it at the end of each day. And I think that's why they've been given three of them. Let's say those students who wash their things only two or three times a week. The rather concern I have, which we would have to implement immediately, is that each student should write their names. If we don't have markers, we should provide it so that the students will write their names on it. Because if, if secondary school is what I remember, it, people will just be picking up other people's face masks, especially mm. if it looks same, you know, yeah. or somebody, can I use yours? I mean, that's just kids being kids, children being children. It's not because they don't understand the disease or anything. So we, they have to understand clearly that this is your face mask. You are supposed to use it for yourself. It's mm -hmm. not supposed uh -huh. to be shared with others, but that can only happen if their names are clearly written on it. And I think those of, I mean, apart from markers, which I don't think are very common in Ghana when I was growing up, the best thing might be for people to sew their names onto their face mask. That's what we did um, when I was in school. You just get a colored thread and sew your name onto your mask. Then nobody would be able to pick it up or mistaken it for something else. I see. For someone I else. Think, okay, but at okay, the same but, time, you're saying that we should wash it immediately after we're done using it. So if we're wearing it the entire day, we can wash it. But how many times can I keep washing that same nose mask doesn't it lose its you know potency after a while no it won't um unless they put like a paper filter in it and i don't know the type of mask they're being given i'm assuming is the multi-layered um cloth face mask yeah so they yeah. can you can reuse it as often as um, possible but what if i have the other ones so the surgical mask the n95 i know that there's a limit to how many times you can use that one after washing what about that in fact the n95s you're not supposed to wash them the surgical mask you're not supposed to wash them because they'll actually come apart there's a way of sterilizing them but i don't think that's what they're being given um mm. my i think it's going to be a reusable cloth um oh, yes. face mask. and i could be wrong but if it's the cloth one they can use it for as long as possible. So long yes, as they, they did say it. they did say that it's the reusable, but just for people because maybe three might not be enough for someone, so they'll decide to add on to it by getting the surgical and the N95. So that's why I was asking that. So would it be advisable to go ahead to wash them just like you're washing the um, you know fabrics as well? 
Right. Um, I think that um, I, I I don't know if people would. I think there's some background noise. Uh, maybe we should go on a short break. No, and no, worries, it's back. fine. We can hear you. Yeah. We can okay. hear you. Go ahead. I'm I'm just saying that um, they can they can they can they can reuse the cloth mask. The surgical mask I would not advise um, they reuse because it's not designed for reuse. Um, and in addition to washing them. I would highly recommend that they also iron them if they can, mm. because you know that the virus gets destroyed at 56 degrees. So in addition to the washing, if you apply heat to it, and I know most um, secondary schools have irons for the children or people go to school with irons. If you iron it, I think you're almost 100 percent certain that you are getting almost like a sterile mask every morning. Okay. A bit controversial this one might be, but we're talking about stigmatization. We've been talking about that for a while now. And also you advise that for people who may have the virus and might have, you know, recovered at some point, it's good that they come out and share their story um, just so that the world knows that this virus actually exists. Now, this weekend we had a case where the health minister was rumored then um, to have been infected by the virus and was receiving treatment at the UG Medical Center. There was a report that came out that denied these rumors and said he was just resting. And then the president, during his address, mentioned and confirmed that the health minister indeed had contracted the virus and was undergoing treatment. Now, if we're saying that we should all come together and fight stigmatization, and the, the person at the helm of affairs um, is not able to tell his story, what does this mean to the fight against COVID-19? Um, well, I think the president laid it all to rest by coming out officially to let the rest of the country know um, because the initial format in which it was rumored and disrumored, if there's a word like that, was inappropriate, like social media and Facebook and through, you know, um, a phone call, um, where a nation and every public health official, even though um, they have their personal privacy. Once you're a public health official, um, your, your, your life is an open book now. And I think that's not just Ghana. It's a well-accepted um, norm around the world. If a senator or congressman or a Supreme Court judge gets cancer, the nation needs to know. And I think similarly it should apply. So I would just say that um, we need to focus on what the president did by mm. honorably letting the country know, and that's the right thing. And Absolutely. every public health of because this is not a sexually transmitted disease. You don't need to have done any wrong to acquire it. You know, you just need to be living life and interacting with people the way you know how. And uh, most of us have tried to put in the right measures. So if you get it, it's time to talk about it. And you, you, what you, you said is right, that actually this will be a great opportunity for him as a public health figure to actually be discussing it on a daily basis, how he is doing. And it will allow people to put away their stigma. Mm. It will allow people to realize that, look, I'm just like the health minister. I got it too, and I don't feel bad about talking about it because I don't think anybody would want to stone him. So those who have been stoning others will rethink that, well... If I'm not going to stone the Minister of Health, there's no point stoning my neighbor. There's no point shunning my neighbor. And that way, I think it would, it would, it, it's a great opportunity that as a country, we should not miss at all. You know, and we could use it as a, a leverage point for personal protective equipment mm. um, and in the use of masks that look, nobody is immune. And this is actually a great opportunity if we look at it that way. Should we close down Parliament? Because then it, it goes to confirm earlier reports in some way that maybe some people in parliament may have contracted it as well? Well, if, if some members of parliament have tested positive... Well, it, was, then it was also another rumor that was debunked by parliament. And then eventually we heard that the health minister had also contracted the virus. Yeah, I think truth and honesty has to be something that we run on. Um, we have to stop guessing and um, rumoring. Like, we have to trust that whatever comes out of um, official um, information is the right word. We, we, there should never be a situation where doubt is created, that something that is said is actually means something else, that black is really black and white is white, so that people can actually take all the right decisions that they need to do to protect themselves. Because... 
we are at war with yeah. an unseen virus. And so there's no point lying. Like if you lie or deny it, you know, people would die. You know, like the president of Burundi. You know, if you deny something, it will take you by surprise. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Anita has a question from one of our viewers for you. Um, okay. So we'll take that. And it says, please, I'm Bethy from Kumasi Atunsu. I have lost my sense of taste and smell for weeks now. I tried treating it, but it still persists. Please, where should I go to get tested for coronavirus? I fear it may be one. Okay, so... um. I, I, I don't know about the testing. I know the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research does some testing. I don't know all the testing points, but I believe if he calls the, the three-digit number that has been provided yeah, for COVID-19, mm. they should be able to tell him. And Accra has um, several testing sites as well. But I must say this. I think this whole thing about sense of smell, um, the studies show that only 4% of people, that is 1 out of 25, will have that loss of sense of smell so i don't want people to overblow it it's not the only sign or symptom of COVID 19. secondly if you get a regular cold and any for years whenever i get a cold i lose my sense of taste and smell it does not mean that anytime somebody loses their sense of smell that they have COVID 19. they need to think of the other things the fever the cough um, and those other things that go with it, the shortness of breath. Um, now we know about this Kawasaki-like syndrome. And so there are more serious things to look out for. But yes, this individual should go and get tested. They may find that it's just a common cold. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertha. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you as always. And we hope to see you, thank God willing, tomorrow. All right. Thank All you right. so much for you're welcome. That was Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai. She is an infectious disease specialist. She's been with us from day one, educating us and also giving us some more information on what's really happening uh, with regards to COVID-19 360. We'll be reading some messages shortly, but we'll be back. It's COVID-19 360. Welcome back to COVID-19 360. And today we'll be speaking to two women who are part of the about 230 Ghanaians who were repatriated from Kuwait on the 23rd of May. Now, upon the arrival in Ghana, they were made to undergo mandatory quarantine under strict uh, security. And out of that, we had about 35 of them testing positive. And so they proceeded to undergo treatment. And I believe that after the two weeks, the rest were allowed to go back home. Now, in the studios today, we have Obahima and Obaya, who were part of those who returned to Ghana from Kuwait. And they're going to be sharing their story with us. And so good morning good and morning. welcome to COVID-19. I remember I spoke to one of you on Zoom yes. and yes. it was, it was you, you, right? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. How long has it been since you left Ghana? It's been five years. Five years? Yes. Oh, so you must be happy to come home finally, <laughs> of right? Of course, I am. It feels good? Good. Yeah? Home is sweet. Yeah. Okay, how about you? Oba? Same. You are Oba, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Same, Same five, five years. years yeah. what, what took you to Kuwait? Was it work? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you were there for five. Okay, fine. Let's move on. Anyway, let's talk about mandatory quarantine and how it was like when you returned home. What was the yeah. treatment like? Yes. Um, to me, it was okay. Everything was okay. Mm. They treated us good. I was okay with it. You were okay with it? You were okay there for how it. many weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks? Two weeks. Yeah. All right. So the moment you touched down? We were drove straight to the place, Pram Pram. Was it a hotel? It wasn't a hotel. I learned it's... Um, a formal... It's a school. Something oh, it was like a school. school? Yeah, it was a school. But it was comfortable, at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. eating means and sports. Eating means and Oh, so both of you were there? Yeah, we were there. Both what was it like? I mean, what was your day like when you were under mandatory quarantine? Uh, when you wake up early morning, you will go for a test. I mean, check your... Vitals. Oh, every morning? Every, every morning. morning. Okay. Every morning you do that. And then after that, you go for your breakfast. Uh. And then everything was normal. Okay. Normal until this um, test result came out. When did they take your, your samples? The, day, the, 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 day, second the second day. day we came. Oh, the second the day. The 24th. Yeah. And how long did it take for the results to come out? It took like um, four to four five, five days. days. Okay, did it all come at the same time for everyone? No, no, no not the same time. Oh, different came, time. Yeah, so yeah. when did you receive yours? It was, it was on the same day, but not on the same time. Okay, the when you say same day, they took your sample. The and fifth then a, day. The fifth day is yeah, when you receive your results. Yeah, yeah. Were you received. scared? Of course I was. Why? <laughs> You'll be scared. When they call someone, uh -huh. they mention a name like, 
Obama oh, and then you are shaking. Yeah. What's happened? What's going on? Uh -huh. So after they take you to the room and then they explain everything to you and then they tell you whether you are positive or you are negative. So for the people who are positive, what, what happened to them? They did they not took, understand. They took them. Some did not understand so, that they so. were positive. When you said did not understand because um we were because all they, looking... not, they did not provide any test results and that brought the problem. Wait. When you test me, you have to give me my results. They didn't give you the results? No. So even for those of you who tested negative, no, they only told you? We don't know. We don't see any results. That is the the results came at the end of the two weeks. That's when they gave you what, a letter? That's when they gave you the results that you've passed. You've gone what through the two at? weeks and you are safe. Okay, so but at the time on. they were breaking the information to you that you had tested no, negative. We did no, we document. not see any document. Did you not request for it? We did. Some of them even fought with them, but... Nothing. The wow. Reason, the reason why they fought with them was we were thinking um, we, we have to see their symptoms. Mm -hmm. Like what they were saying, running, um, temperature, coughing. Okay. Before you believe that you have it. Yes. But there was but nothing like that. Later, they explained to us and that. So later, they explained everything. But oh, so pr then, prior to that, you didn't know that asymptomatic patients. No, we didn't know. We, we didn't, didn't know, know it was like that earlier on. It was later we realized. It wasn't like that. And that was because you saw someone exhibiting symptoms? Or we didn't nobody see showing anything. Nobody. What happened to the people who tested positive? Did they bring ambulances to take yes, them? Yes, they yes, yes. There was ambulance standing by ambulance, ambulance and then and they, they, they took them took straight them to Kaswa. Okay. Are okay. you in touch with any of them to know whether they are doing yeah, well? Yeah, I, someone called me yesterday and said perhaps today they'll, they'll be, be going, going home. home. Oh, they'll be going home? Yes. Did she tell you what kind of treatment they were giving them? I. I I'm not there, so I wouldn't know yeah, much. Yeah, but you said you spoke to her, so that's what I'm asking, that maybe did you have a conversation about that? Yes, we did, but she said, all is okay, it's okay. What will you do? It's okay. Exactly. <laughs> but what was it like finally reuniting with your family, knowing that you don't have COVID-19, you've been asking on government to bring you home for so long, and now it was time to go home? Mm. You, cannot, you cannot imagine the joy, the happiness, because it's been a long... We have been quarantined in Kuwait for one month. And a whole here, month? Yes, a whole month before we came here. So it has been a long time we been since we we outside from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. We were in isolation center in the Kuwait before we came here. I mean, one month and two weeks before we got home. So it's why did they have you in isolation in Kuwait? Was it after you, you had... coming in? Before mm -hmm. you come to the airport anywhere. They isolate you. But they had tested you and already. And they test you. Okay. Before you go to the airport. So that means that you, were you even able to communicate with family whilst yeah, you were yes. Okay, everything yeah. was fine. Everything was fine. Everything was okay. A whole month. A whole month. And then it delays. Not because the Kuwait government wanted to keep us for a whole month. Mm -hmm. No, but our government so here, our the, the, the airport closed was closed and, and the borders no were closed. For us to that pass is and come the home. problem. That's, that was all kept at for. Oh, that's, I see. Yeah. But then you opted to come home, right? Yes. So there are some Ghanaians who are still there. Yes. Yeah, a lot. A lot. A lot of them. Are yes. they asking to come? No, we I don't, don't know. Think so. But I wanted to come. So. so tell me the process. When you said you wanted to come, what did you have to do to be part of the group that came to Ghana? Okay. The Kuwait government is an uh, amnesty. Uh -huh. So whoever wants to go home, even they put you in the process, you will register your ID and all those things. And then they will take you to the quarantine place. Mm -hmm. So we pass through all these procedures for, for I think, from 26th of April mm. to 30th of April. That was for Africans. Ghanians, for the Africans. For Africans. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we did everything and we were waiting for the government to open us so we can come home. Why did you have to pay? To be part of the group? No, we It was it. all free. It was all free. Okay, all but free. if it wasn't for COVID-19, would you have still wanted to come back home and would you have come earlier? For me, okay. I wanted, for, me, let, let for me, I was ready to come home before the COVID started and then the lockdown. So I couldn't come because of the lockdown. So you had already bought a ticket and everything? I, 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 nearly, I nearly did it, but when I, came, when I came home from work and then just four days, the lockdown came. So I called the embassy and they said I should hold on. Mm, okay. So whilst I was holding on, and then the government also said there's been an amnesty. So if you want to go, then so I had can. to join them and then. What about you, Bahima? Yes. 
Were you already planning to come home? And if there wasn't coming... I even did my uh, TC, which is travel certificate. Oh. I wanted to come, but not this time. Not this time? Yes. What I wanted to this? come in December. Yeah. But, but since I was home, yeah. I stayed home for three months. But well, why did not, you want to come back home? Because I was not working. Because of the virus, nobody... We are all back home. And we are not because working. Because of the lockdown. Because of the lockdown, you You're cannot go out. Go anywhere, you cannot so. do anything. So it was affecting you? Yes, of was course. Was the government not providing any... Not all of us. For his Only people. For his, for his people. people. Yes. And for, did you have the documents? Or your documents had expired? Um, for my, me, my all was expired. Yours as well? Same, same. Okay, yeah. so then in that case, you were considered illegal yes. migrants. So they yeah. were not helping you in any way? No. They were. They in the were, way they were doing it. How? The way Tell they me. were doing it. Um, the embassy there was also helping. They've mm. been coming around where the, the Ghana Ghana embassy? The, where the Ghanaian community are mm. to provide some food and, and stuff. And they, they were helping. So you received some help from, from them? Personally, Personally, I did not, but people received it. So how were you surviving? <laughs> I had somebody with me, so okay. I, was, I was able to. How were you surviving? Mm, actually, I was staying at an accommodation for my company. Okay. And so they were providing for us. Oh, okay. So you didn't have to pay for rent no. and all that? No. 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 All right. No. Okay, that's great then. Now that you're home, what's going to be happening? What are you doing? What are you planning on doing? A lot. Do you want to go back to Kuwait at some people, point? Me, I will want to go back if I have the opportunity. I you would want to go back? I will want to go back if I have the opportunity. But I wouldn't want to go with the same visa I went with the first one. What visa was that? And that was visa, visa 20. 20. Uh -huh. Break it down for me. For someone who that, doesn't know what that visa is. That visa is working in the house, like a house made of, yeah. And then, okay. and then we have the visa 18 for the companies. So okay. if I'm supposed to go back, I will want to go with the 18 visa. So like you can work, work for a company. company or you don't want yeah. to go back as a, a, no, a worker? No, as why? a house help. Why? Tell me why. Well, you don't have a freedom on your own if you, you the are, like is you, should, you know like if you're a house help, you can't do what you want to do every time someone has to control you control like you do TV this, don't do it, go here, don't go. You don't have But at least they were paying you well. They were paying you well, yeah. Okay, yeah. you weren't being maltreated in any way? No. Not no. at all. For me, no. Okay. I was okay. The people I had I was staying with were good. Everything okay. was okay. All right. But yeah. you had the visa 18 then because you said you're working with a company. I didn't have visa 18. What did you have? I had visa 20. But okay. <laughs> I have some friends and then I communicate with them. I don't want to do this visa 20 job anymore. So I wanted to change my visa to visa 18. Okay. So I got a company which they wanted to sponsor me for my visa. Okay. But this is where this whole virus started. Mm -hmm. So I was working with them, though I was using my visa 20. Yeah. So the visa 18 and the visa 20, I learned that now the visa 20 is not working anymore. Okay. They stopped issuing they visa 20? Yes, they stopped issuing it because when they take you home, Some everything people. is not working. I mean, they, they said the labor law in the country is not working for those working in the house. And that is a problem we have in Kuwait. We okay. want somebody to speak for the majority of the Ghanaians who are voiceless, uh -huh. the, the, the visa 20 and the house working, the labor law doesn't work. Okay. Why? When somebody is working in Kuwait, he's supposed to be every, every, every week at least one day off. Uh -huh. But when we are working in the house, that one day off is not working. Mm. No. Secondly, they take your documents from you. Your passport. The your moment passport, you get there? Yes. They your take passport. It just as you arrive from the airport. From the airport. The person who brought you take your passport and everything from you because she or he sponsored for you. He, she, or, she or he is your sponsor. So that is where we have a problem. Okay. Now that Nanado has brought the embassy for us, we want the embassy to do the needful for us. But did you explain to the embassy what The embassy is aware of all this. They are aware. Okay. Because when somebody arrived in Kuwait, even when my first one, I was having a problem with my employer, I talked to them. I, mm. I went to the embassy and talked to them. Mm. They did not do anything. They did not say anything. 
They only ask me to go back to work for them or I pay them the money they are requesting for, mm -hmm. which is not logic. It's not law. Wow. So we want the embassy to talk for us. Mm -hmm. We want them to fix, to make everything fix like stronghold like we are the Ghanaians we have somebody for, for to talk for us and we if they fix somebody. it would you go back of course even if they fix it or not <laughs> if i get a chance today i will go back you leave don't you think that you can start something in ghana we can hold on on that thought <laughs> we'll be back <laughs> to continue this conversation it's covered 19 360. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19, 360. And in the studios, I have Obaya and Obahima, who are part of the about 230 Ghanaians who were repatriated from Kuwait on the 23rd of May 2020 as a result, of course, of COVID-19. We'll also be speaking to another stranded Ghanaian in the Netherlands. We spoke to him some weeks ago, and we want to do a follow-up. But before that, Anita has some messages for us. All right, so this one from Eto Francis in a Sherman says, our numbers keep shooting up, yet we're asked to go back to school. Can you tell the government to start putting up some structures, even if it's wooden structures? Because immediately we hit 20K, it can be anything. Okay, this one also says, yes, I agree with the government that the face mask must be provided to the students before even entering campus. And this is from Aaron K. Bella and Anita, if a whole Minister of Health having access to all the PPEs and telling us to observe all the protocols, couldn't protect himself from contracting the virus, how much more students? And this is famous from who? Okay, this is quite lengthy, but I'll take it. Good morning, Bella. Hmm. In fact, COVID-19 and school reopening is not the best idea. Cra Below are the suggestions I want to put across. All universities should carry out total online courses to include exams and no direct lectures. SHS and GHS final year exams should still hold on. And uh, SHS, okay, I can tell you that as of now, people at various parts of the nation don't believe in the reality of this virus. And as of now that the cases are rising up, that we deem it fit to open school, this shouldn't be the case at all. Education is not down with elderly people on wearing nose masks. How much more JHS students? Ghana, let's rise up and... And think fast. How often are the PPEs going to be provided for teachers and students who are going to test human life with this reopening thing? President Nanado should take a second thought on this reopening. And this is coming from Godfred Lawe in Kwame Krum, Biakuye District. Hello, Bella. I'm Bethy from Kumasi Atuntu. I have, okay, this one was addressed by Dr. Bertha. Okay, this one says, Good morning, Bella and Anita. You guys are looking beautiful as always. Thank you. I want to know what's happening at the various universities since the final year students have resumed. Okay. Good morning, Bella and Anne. Hope you ladies are doing well. Yes, we are. How does 11,964 cases tell a decline of our fight in this pandemic? Where the health ministry and information ministry in the press briefing as far back as a month ago, told us that we've reached the peak. And this is from the general from KTB. Good morning and thanks for educating us. But the hard truth is our cases will continue to rise until the problem of releasing results two weeks after test is solved. Ghana recording more cases because of more tests is not something we should be proud of. Knowing our status within 24 hours after testing will help reduce the community spread. But waiting for two good weeks or more before receiving results and without quarantine, which is happening currently, will continue to increase our cases. Thank you. And that is a concern I share as well. Good morning. Now, we the students are going to suffer in school. Doctor, I think the testing will be very good because it will help to know those who have been infected by the virus. And if not, then all the students in school will get the virus. This can create panic and fear in some schools. So I think the testing must be done and it is good. And that is Benjamin from Isiam. And then final one. Bella and Anita, please tell the President and Ministry of Information to lock down the hotspot area. So hmm. I guess they are watching and listening as well. Absolutely, they are. And so we're crossing over to the Netherlands where we have Pastor Jonathan on the line with us. If you would recall, we spoke to him a few weeks ago where he also uh, told us how in need he was uh, in terms of getting back home. It's been weeks and here he is still in the Netherlands. Good morning, Reverend. Yeah, good morning. I hope you're well. Well, by God's grace. So, since the last time we spoke, has there been any improvement in terms of how you can get back home? Not at all. Nothing so far? 
Not you mentioned that you had filled some forms earlier, and we were hoping that maybe by now they would have gotten back to you. Any feedback? I had a feedback about, uh, I think, three weeks ago, and very brief. And they said they've received my message, and they will get in touch with me as soon as they hear something from my crowd. That was it. Nothing at all? Okay. Now, no. recently also, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Madam Shelley Ayokobochi, mentioned that they were working towards uh, helping some about 3,000 Ghanaians stranded abroad to get back home. Are you aware of this? And has there been any process that started? Yeah, I've been monitoring it on the Ghana web, and I had a similar information I read from the Ghana web. But with the embassy here in the Den Haag, the Netherlands, no information at all, no official information. You tried calling them and they didn't pick up? My sister, the lines are not working. So I sent them an email um, about, I think, last week, telling mm. them that the lines on advertised on the websites are not working. So mm -hmm. I, I just try to draw the attention to the fact that if they are not aware, then I'm trying to remind them so they can activate the line. So those of us stranded here can have a means of communicating with them. Yeah. And I had a brief information that they are providers are working on their lines mm -hmm. and that as soon as the problem is resolved they will let us know meanwhile they've advertised a different line on the website so i tried that line and it went through then i spoke to one lady who said they have not had any information and as soon as they have any information they will get back to me since then i've not heard anything how long ago was this that was last wednesday until now nothing no show Okay, let's just say that, okay, they return to you with some information. Now, they're asking for most Ghanaians who are stranded abroad to pay for their, um, you know, tickets. They're likely to even pay for, you know, mandatory quarantine as well. Are you in that position yeah. to do that? Well, we have heard about that. And with the ticket issue, we don't have much problem, you see. Mm. Um, I remember the first time I spoke with them, they asked me to do a um, COVID-19 test on my own. And yeah. then I asked the lady if that is possible, because um, we know these programs are being taken over by government. Mm -hmm. But there's a construction from Accra. Well, by the grace of God, I managed to get the COVID-19 test done on my own. I have to pay 119 euros for it. Okay. Yes, um, by the grace of God, it's out. And with the tickets, by the grace of God, um, even if I don't have it here, my wife can buy, send money from Ghana, mm. and then pay. So I don't have a problem with that. What about mandatory and, quarantine? Yes, we had issue with the mandate. That is where I have a problem with. Okay, tell us why. I have a problem with the mandatory quarantine because, one, all over the world, mandatory quarantine is being catered for by government and not individuals. And then secondly, and if that is to be done at all, I mean, spending as Hooping some of seven, nine to seven thousand cities, 14 days on a hotel of the government choice. I think mm -hmm. that is not right. I mean, the reason I'm saying that is, you know, the issue of the pandemic has taken a toll on everybody, mm -hmm. government, individuals, and we are all suffering. So if we are stranded and the government is expecting us to raise this money from this place, mm -hmm. your point of departure, pay into the account of the hotel in ghana mm -hmm. before you are evacuated that is indirect way of telling you that we are not letting you in mm -hmm. i didn't come to work i came for ministry program and even by the time we get here because of the pandemic most of the ministries programs were cancelled yeah. churches were suspended mm -hmm. so the best you can do is to go back home the ministry kept me in a hotel for some time when the bill started skyrocketing they have to arrange to put you in the house of a member hoping you will get back home and then you are here and then you are told raise money to pay hotel bill where you'll be quarantined yeah. before you are released to your home i mean come on so, so you would have preferred that government takes up that cost is that what you're saying or would you have wanted to pay partially come again would you have preferred that government absorbs the entire cost for mandatory quarantine or do you suggest that you pay part and government also pays part but I, I, I prefer the government absorbs that. And even okay. if they are not able to absorb, can we look at other options? Other okay. options as in, um, I heard the Pentecost Convention Center has been given to government as a, real, a, a place for COVID-19 patients. I don't know how true that is. 
Yeah, that's Previously, more like an isolation okay. and treatment. That's for isolation and treatment? That's for isolation and treatment. Uh -huh. Now, so, I mean, we can be put there. That, not, um, uh, that is not the only issue. And when you look at our universities, I mean, now I heard from the president's speech yesterday that schools are going back. Yes, final year yeah, students are actually in school from today. So universities are out of the question, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. And even so secondary then, schools as well. Yes. Now, so I think alternate means should be looked at. But, I mean, putting all the cost of the quarantine on us, that is, I can say it's not fair. All right. Because... People are giving to support the COVID-19 pandemic issue. When you go to America, I mean, people are giving, companies okay. are giving. I mean, the public is giving to support. So this is a time we see the importance of governance. Government can also do something to support the citizen with those of us stranded. But if we are stranded and we have been expected to raise the money to pay right. for our own mandatory quarantine back home, then it's like you are making already bad problem worse for us. And All indirectly right. telling us that we are not welcome no and problem. All right, Reverend, thank you so much for speaking to us, and we hope that we can relay this information to the authorities. Let's hope that something can be done. But stay strong. And I'm still here with Obaya and Obahima, who are part of the Ghanaians who uh, were evacuated from Kuwait some three weeks ago. And so they're saying that if they get an opportunity, they'd rather go back than start something here. That's actually from Obahima. And so tell me that briefly. My time is up so we can wrap up. You're telling me that you'd go back. If the conditions are better. Yeah, if what the about, conditions are better. What about Ghana? You don't want to... Ghana is my up. home. Ghana is my country. I have a family here. So I love to stay here. Okay. I love to stay in Ghana, but... Would it not have been better if there was a pandemic and you were already in Ghana? I mean, looking at the situation, are these people are able to go back to work? They can make some money, even though we're being asked to protect ourselves. Yes. Is it not better instead of being in someone's land? It's better. That's why I came. Yeah, but you're because saying you're I going know uh -huh. I know here I can move on one here and there and make my own profit. Until there's an opportunity yes. to go back. What I'm about right. you, Abaya? Are we, you say you're going back. Isn't there something <laughs> here to do? There is a lot. There's a lot you can do? There's a lot we can do here. But you can't compare there to home. What, because of how much you make there? Of course. Okay, of it's course. better there. It's better there. Mm. It's better there. Okay, if you were in Ghana, what would you have been doing? I'm a seamstress. I'm a, a fashion designer. You're a fashion designer? Yeah, yeah. And you don't think that you can make more here than in Kuwait? <laughs> I'd rather be there. Okay, you'd give yeah. up your fashion yeah. design work to work I'll have to go and organize home. much more money and then come home and then establish a big tie. I see. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. moving forward, how are you protecting yourselves? I know there's no mask and all of that. Mm. By washing our hands, sanitizing our hands. Mm. Doing as our president said, we're doing it, and that's the only way. Okay. To well, we hope that you stay safe and thank you, you don't contract the virus. Thank you. We want to say and something. Yes, go ahead. Um, we want to thank the Kuwait government. We say thank you a lot for the how far he has brought us. We have to thank the Almighty God for how far he has brought us because it's been a long way to Ghana here. And also, we thank the president of the Republic of Ghana and the health minister and all the protocols that make the quarantine safe for us. Mm. And also, we thank the Ghanaian embassy in Kuwait. But they are trying their best, but at least their they best should. Their best is not enough. Their yes, best is not, not enough. <laughs> we want them to try hard for us. But Ghana has tried for you, because imagine course, if you had to course. pay for a ticket and also But pay for Ghana did not pay the ticket for us. Please. Kuwait government. Well, I mean, yes, sorry, us. it was taken care of by Kuwait, but mandatory quarantine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was 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 for the government. Was so at least Ghana also tried. Yeah, that's why we are yes. thanking all of them yeah. for making this a successful travel into our home country. Absolutely. And we thank, thank you, TV3, also for the interviews, for the. You know, you are making most it part possible of it for us, for us to because you we were home. calling when we were in yes. there. We yeah. were crying, we were, we were calling, calling we what were is concerned. going on yes. and the whole lot. We so thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you and as God well bless for coming you. on. Oh. And stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. All right, safe. well, that's about it for today. Oh, don't leave it. So relax. <laughs> that's it for today, COVID-19 360. And we do hope that, uh, you know, the cries of people who are stranded abroad will be heard by government. Not everyone can foot the mandatory quarantine bill, looking at how high the figure is. And so, government, if you're listening, if you're watching, please come to the aid of your citizens. On that note, my name is Berla Mundi. I've been doing this with Anita Ekuya Ekufu. 
and I had in the studios of Baya and Obahema. We'll see you tomorrow, God willing. Have a good day and watch TV3 all day.